We begin our tales of the deadliest woman in the world with one whose kill count was only one man, but the brutality and severity of her crime, as well as the depravity, marks it as one of the most notable and infamous crimes in Australian history. Catherine Knight was born and raised in an unconventional and dysfunctional family environment. Her mother Barbara had been married to a man named Jack Ruffin and had four sons with him before starting up an adulterous relationship with one of her husband's friends and co-workers, Ken Knight. This caused a major scandal in their small hometown of Aberdeen, forcing Barbara to move to another town. None of her sons went with her, the two older ones remaining with her former husband, while the two younger ones went to live with an aunt in Sydney. Barbara went on to have four more children with Ken Knight, two of which were twin girls born in 1955. Catherine Knight was the younger of the twin girls. In 1959, when Catherine was four, Barbara's first husband, Jack Ruffin, died and the two older boys moved in with Barbara and Ken. While nothing critical was really said about the long-suffering Jack, Ken was a man who left much to be desired. He was a violent alcoholic who openly used intimidation to rape his wife up to ten times a day. Barbara, in turn, would often confide in her daughter's intimate details of her sex life and how much she hated men and sex. Catherine also claimed that she was frequently sexually assaulted by members of her own family, though not by her father, and this continued till she was about 11 years old. Apart from her own twin sister, Catherine was really only close to one other member of her family, her uncle, Oscar Knight, who was a champion horseman. She was devastated in 1969 when he committed suicide and continues to maintain to this day that his ghost still visits her. It would seem that this combination of tragedy and sexual dysfunction created the monster that Catherine would become. When she attended high school, Knight became a loner and was remembered by her classmates as somewhat of a bully to those weaker and smaller than her. She had a constant undercurrent of rage, but was a model student and often received rewards for good behavior. Knight would leave school at 15 without learning to read or write, and took a menial job as a cutter in a clothing factory. A year later, she would be offered her, quote, dream job, cutting up offal at a local slaughterhouse. She showed a knack for the work and was quickly promoted to boning and given her own set of butcher knives. At home, the knives were hung over her bed so that they, quote, would always be handy if I needed them, a habit she continued every place she lived all the way up until her incarceration. Knight would marry her first husband, hard-drinking co-worker David Kellett, in 1974. The pair would have what could be best described as a contentious and toxic relationship. Even Knight's mother would provide David with a warning regarding her daughter's violent temper at their wedding. Quote, the old girl, Knight's mother, said to me to watch out. You better watch this one or she'll fucking kill you. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're fucked. Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll fucking kill you. And that was her mother talking. She told me she's got something loose. She's got a screw loose somewhere." Unquote. This would prove to be an eerie prediction since the first outburst of unpredictable violence would occur on their wedding night when Knight attempted to strangle Kellett. She later explained that it was because he fell asleep after having intercourse with her only three times. On another occasion, a heavily pregnant knight would burn all of Kellett's clothing and shoes before hitting him in the back of the head with a frying pan hard enough to result in a fractured skull. Why? Because he had dared to arrive home late 
from a darts tournament. Police allegedly wished to charge Knight for the attack, but she talked David into dropping the charges. Another incident occurred in May 1976, shortly after the birth of their first child. David had enough of Catherine's violent and dangerous outbursts and had left her for another woman, moving to Queensland. The next day, Knight was seen pushing her newborn daughter in a stroller down the street, shaking the carriage roughly from side to side. Catherine was admitted to a St. Elmo's hospital and was diagnosed with postnatal depression and was released after several weeks in recovery. But the recovery didn't last, as not long after she was released, Catherine placed her two-month-old daughter, Melissa, on the railway tracks shortly before the train was due. She then stole an axe and went into town threatening to kill people. A vagrant in the area known as Old Ted, who was often seen foraging around the train yard, discovered the abandoned baby and rescued her only minutes before the arrival of the train. Knight was arrested and returned to St. Elmo's Hospital, but was able to sign herself out on her own recognizance the following day. A few days later, Catherine was back to her old habits. She carjacked a woman and slashed her face with one of her butcher knives, demanding that the woman drive her to Queensland in order to find her wayward husband. The woman managed to escape when they stopped at a service station, but by the time the police arrived to take Knight into custody, she had gained a hostage, a 10-year-old boy whom she threatened with the same knife. Comically, police managed to disarm the unstable woman with brooms, and she was spirited off to the Morissette Psychiatric Hospital where she was admitted. Knight told the nurses that she had intended to first kill the mechanic who had repaired Kellett's car, which had allowed him to flee to Queensland in the first place. Then, upon arriving in Queensland, she claimed she intended to kill both David Kellett and his mother. For reasons that defy explanation, when Kellett was informed of this threat against him, He left his girlfriend and with his mother returned to Aberdeen to look after Catherine. Catherine Knight was released in August of 1976 to the care of her mother-in-law and husband, and the trio relocated to Woodbridge, a suburb of Adelaide where Knight got a job at another meatpacking plant. But the peace wouldn't last. In 1984, after the birth of their second child, Knight left Kellett and moved in first with her parents and then into a rented home in nearby Muswellbrook. She returned to work at the slaughterhouse but injured her back and was given a disability pension. No longer needing to rent a home close to work, she moved into government-provided housing commission housing near Aberdeen. David Kellett wouldn't be the last man that Catherine would terrorize with her violent and impulsive temper. She met 38-year-old David Saunders in 1986. A few months after the relationship began, Saunders moved in with Knight and her two daughters, though he kept his own old apartment in Scone. The insecure Knight would become suspicious and jealous of Saunders regarding his activities or what he did when she wasn't around, and she'd often throw him out of the house. He would return to his old apartment, but not long after, a remorseful and weeping Knight would beg him to return. This cycle continued, and Knight's cruelty and jealousy only deepened. It hit a disturbing crescendo in May of 1987, when, as a petty example of what she would do to him if he ever cheated on her, Knight slit the throat of Saunders' two-month-old dingo pup in front of him. Then she knocked him unconscious with a frying pan. But yet David Saunders stayed. And perhaps it was because Knight had become pregnant with his child, a third daughter, Sarah. This prompted Saunders to put a down payment on a home which Knight paid off when her workers' compensation settlement came through in 1989. Knight proceeded to decorate the home with animal skins, horns, skulls, 
rusty animal traps, leather jackets, machetes, old boots, rakes, and pitchforks. No space in the home, including the ceilings, were left uncovered. In short, picture Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre having a show on HGTV, and you've pretty much nailed the aesthetic that Catherine Knight was going for. The piece was temporary in this new little house of horrors, and Knight's temper against her bow would once again coalesce into a violent attack. After an argument where she hit Saunders in the face with a hot iron, before stabbing him in the stomach with a pair of scissors, David Saunders finally had enough and moved back to his apartment in Scone. He returned to the home he shared with Knight briefly, only to find that she had sliced up all of his clothing. This prompted David to take a leave of absence from his work and go into hiding. Knight attempted to locate him via his friends and family, but no one would admit to knowing where David was. Finally, when he emerged from hiding to visit his daughter, he found that Knight had vindictively turned the tables on him. She had gone to the police and claimed she was afraid of him, and in one of the most ironic turns of events since the coining of the term Jumbo Shrimp, the police instituted a protection order for Catherine Knight against David. Needless to say, this was the final nail in the coffin in her relationship with David Saunders, but Catherine Knight didn't stay single for long. In 1990, she became pregnant by a former slaughterhouse co-worker, 43-year-old John Chillingsworth. She would give birth to a boy that the pair named Eric. The relationship with Chillingworth lasted three years before he, arguably luckier than his predecessors, would be left by night for another man that she was having an affair with, John Price. It was her relationship with John Price and the shocking crime that ensued that would launch Catherine Knight into the ranks of some of the deadliest women in the world. John Pricey Price was already the father of three children when he began his affair with Catherine Knight. Divorced in 1988, John Price was, by all accounts, a, quote, terrific bloke who was liked by everyone who knew him. His youngest daughter, two years old at the time, lived with his ex-wife, while the two older children remained living with him. Apparently, despite being well aware of Knight's violent reputation, he still allowed her to move in with him and his children in 1995. His children seemed to like her, and John was making good money working in the local mines, and, according to witnesses, apart from some violent arguments, at first, quote, life was a bunch of roses. But as expected, the domestic bliss soon took a downward turn. In 1998, the pair had a fight over Price's refusal to marry Knight, and in retaliation, she videotaped items that he had stolen from his workplace and sent the tape to Price's boss. And even though the items were expired medical kits that Price had scavenged from the company's trash, he was subsequently fired from the job he held for 17 years. That same day, Price kicked Catherine out of his house while word spread around town of what she had done. Perhaps feeling lonely or depressed, a few months later, Price restarted the relationship, but quickly established the boundary that Knight was not allowed to live in his home anymore. The fights between the two became more frequent, and most of Price's friends would have nothing to do with him so long as he was with this crazy woman. Others could easily see the volatility of the quickly derailing relationship, but unfortunately for John Price, the realization would come too little too late. In February of 2000, a series of assaults on Price culminated with Knight stabbing Price in the chest, as she had done with previous boyfriends in the heat of her violent temper. But this was one step too far, and Price, finally fed up, kicked Knight out of his home for good. On the 29th of February, 
he stopped at the Scone Magistrate's Court on his way to work to take out a restraining order against Catherine Knight that would keep her away from both him and his children. That same afternoon, Price would tell co-workers that if he didn't show up for work the next day, it would be because Knight had killed him. They pleaded with him not to return to the home, but Price was concerned that Knight might, in retaliation, harm or kill his children if he didn't. Price arrived home from work to find that Knight, who still had access to the home but wasn't home at the time, had sent the children off to spend the night at a sleepover at a friend's house. Price would spend the evening with his neighbors until he retired for the evening around 11 p.m. By contrast, Knight, earlier that day, had bought a new set of black lingerie and had walked around her home videotaping her children with commentary that was later interpreted by the courts as being some kind of crude will. Knight arrived at the home after Price had gone to sleep and let herself in. She sat watching TV for a few moments before taking a shower. She then proceeded to wake Price up and the pair had sex before he would fall back to sleep. It was John Price's last night alive. At six the next morning, a neighbor became concerned at the fact that Price's work truck was still in the driveway long after he was supposed to have left. When he did not arrive at his workplace, his boss sent a co-worker to Price's home to see what was wrong. Both the neighbor and the co-worker tried knocking on Price's bedroom window in an attempt to wake him, but upon discovering blood on the front door, they immediately notified the police who arrived in the home at around 8 a.m. Unable to get a response from anyone inside the home, police breached the back entrance to find Knight near comatose from an overdose of pills in an attempted suicide and a house of absolute horrors. Sometime during the evening after Price had fallen back asleep, it was determined that Knight had retrieved one of the knives kept above the bed and stabbed Price in the chest. Price awoke and attempted to turn the light on and flee from his assailant while Knight chased him through the house. Blood splatter found all over the home was mute testament to John Price's fight for life. He managed to make it to the front door, but was pulled back inside by night where he was stabbed a total of 37 times before bleeding out. The wounds were on both the front and back of the body, with many of them deep enough to puncture and lacerate major organs. But it wasn't enough for Catherine Knight to simply murder the man who had rejected her. She wanted to make an example of him. And so she did. The following is an account of the complete report by crime scene investigator, Detective Senior Constable Peter Musio, one of the first officers on the scene. Quote, I entered the premises to conduct a cursory examination with Detective Sergeant Raymond. I walked in through the rear door and into the kitchen. Once inside the kitchen, I saw a large section of what appeared to be human skin hanging from the top architrave of the doorway leading into the lounge room. The piece of skin extended from the top of the doorway right to the floor and appeared to be an entire human skin. Looking through the doorway into the lounge room, I could see a headless and skinless human body. I walked east along the hallway and into the entry foyer and saw an extreme amount of blood pooled on the floor. There was also a large amount of blood smearing over the eastern wall of the entry." Unquote. Sometime after his death, Knight had decapitated Price's body and taken her skill with knives honed for many years of laboring in a slaughterhouse to skin Price entirely, hanging the intact skin suit flensed from his form on a stainless steel meat hook in an arched doorway leading into the lounge. But this was far from the end of the horror within the walls 
of the peaceful suburban home. According to Constable Musio, quote, I noticed a blood trail leading from the lounge room into the kitchen towards the kitchen cooktop in the vicinity of the aluminum broiler. The boiler was on the right side rear element, which at the time was turned off. When I lifted the lid to the boiler, I noticed it was warm to the touch. The pot was full of liquid, and on the surface I could identify a skinned human head and a number of cooked vegetables. On the northern side of the aluminum boiler, I saw a baking dish, which was sitting across the right front side element. Inside the baking dish, I saw an amount of liquid and the remains of baked vegetables. Just to the right or northern side of the cooktop, I saw two prepared meals. Each of the meals consisted of two pieces of cooked meat, baked potato, baked pumpkin, zucchini, cabbage, yellow squash, and gravy. Underneath each of the meals was a torn section of kitchen paper with a name written on it. The word Becky was written in blue ink pen on one of the pieces, while the word Jonathan was on the other. The pieces of meat that appeared on the plates were similar to the piece I collected from the rear lawn." Unquote. The names crudely scrawled on the place cards by the horrendous banquet of human flesh were those of John Price's children. It was gathered that Knight intended to serve their father's cooked flesh to his own offspring had they arrived home. The pot on the stove containing the skinned, decapitated head and meat from the victim's buttocks was found by officers to still be warm, indicating that the cooking had occurred earlier in the wee hours of the morning. Sometime later, Knight would rearrange Price's headless and skinless remains with the left arm draped over an empty liter soda bottle and the legs crossed. In court, this posing was claimed to be a final defilement to show Knight's contempt for Price. She had also left a handwritten note on top of a photograph of Price full of basic spelling errors and stained with bits of flesh and blood. It read, quote, Time got you back, Jonathan, for raping my daughter. You to Beck, Price's daughter, for Ross, for little John, his son. Now play with little John's dick, John Price, unquote. The bizarre accusations made in the note were found to be groundless and false. Despite intensive questioning, Catherine Knight maintained that she had no recollection of the events in the home after having sex with Price once she had recovered from her suicide attempt. Yet, in another bizarre twist, it was discovered that after the murder, Knight had gone into town in Aberdeen and withdrawn $1,000 from John Price's bank account via an automatic teller machine. What the plans were for taking the money remains unknown. On March 6, 2000, despite her claims that she did not recall the crime, Catherine Knight was charged with John Price's murder. At her trial in October 2001, she spared the victim's family the ordeal of a trial by pleading guilty. According to court-appointed psychiatrists, she was sane at the time of the murder. On November 8, 2001, Justice Barry O'Keefe sentenced Catherine Knight to a lifetime behind bars without the possibility of parole. The first woman in Australia ever to receive such a sentence. To accentuate the severity of her crime and the gravity of her sentence, Catherine Knight's inmate file bears the ominous warning, quote, never to be released. She has since contested the severity of the sentence. She is currently serving her sentence at Mulawa Women's Correctional Center, where she works as a cleaner. And while she is a good cook, it is highly unlikely that she will ever get a job in the prison kitchen.